Good to see all of you. Welcome to City on a Hill. My name is Tim. We are going to be in Romans chapter 5 this morning. And Kid City last week organized some notes for me. Uh, if you were here for our members meeting, I read a couple of them. You know, sometimes in the... Come on. Sometimes in the holiday season, people get discouraged. And we uh, probably need to give them encouragement. And so Kid City got together and sent their pastor some notes of encouragement. I thought I would share some of them. Some of them, uh, the kids actually talked to their parents, so they came from the adults. And here's uh, some of the responses that I got to read this week. One was, I love how transparent you are and how highly you speak of Jesus. That was code for you're just a deep sinner, right? Um, this one is more accurate than you even know. Thankful God gave you the smarts to marry Kelly. I mean, like. <laughs> and then we went to the kids. First, first kids uh, note I pulled out said, you're really nice and funny. And I thought, well, I tricked that kid because I'm definitely not nice and just occasionally funny. Uh, the next one was I, from the kids. I love Tim because he makes me laugh. That's kid speak for he looks goofy, right? And then we went into the series of I like your stuff, like uh, I like your shoes, one of the kids says. I like your bike, one of the kids says. I like your hair, one of the kids says. That must come from a West girl, right? Um, I still have a little hair, and uh, Anna uh, cuts it for me and plays wonderful piano for us this morning. And then my favorite of all is Mr. Tim has a fun dinosaur that stands by itself. So a lot of deep theology in, in that one, yeah. That was just one of the kids' comments about what they like about Tim. So, so what a glorious week in the gospel last week. I mean, like, I mean, like Matthias Lot comes in here and just blows us away. You know, Mark uh, does what he does, shouting about the greatness of Jesus. Um, the imagination audit was amazing. If you if you came from that, and, and I know some of you have already told me you're transferring your membership to St. Charles. That's that's okay. I I, I get it. Um, but Romans is where we are, right? Romans is where we are. And today, as Matt was reading, I'm just going to give you a bigger idea than the big idea that I thought the Spirit had given me before we get in here. And it's simply this, that oftentimes I think American Christianity gets stuck in the idea that Jesus' death has forgiven me so I can see a good eternity, uh, that my eternity is taken care of. That's a that's a beautifully accurate thing, but it's just part of the gospel. As I heard, as I listened to Matt, I heard uh, Paul's voice through Matt th by the Spirit saying, yes, but his resurrection brings power for, for now, but also his, what, what happens for us is we get his sinless life. We get his life. We don't just get him, his death being important for us. We actually get the life that Jesus lived. So our biggest idea this morning is that. That a bunch of you are, as we have said before in this series, just trying to get to the end and sin a little less. And the problem with that is there's no hope in that. There's no joy in that. There's no leading people to Jesus. I would ask you this morning, how many people have you led to Jesus and, gotten, and have gotten baptized because they watched your life and they said, I can't wait to have what that person has. That is the goal of your life, that people would see the glory of Jesus in you and want what you have. That happens when you say, I get the life of Jesus. I'm receiving the life of Jesus. That's in the passage today. I'll point it out to you again uh, when we get there. But Romans chapter 4 was important for us because we uh, have celebrated. We've just celebrated that we've been saved by our faith in Jesus Christ alone. We are saved by his our faith in his sinless life, saved by our faith in his death, we're saved by uh, our faith in his resur resurrection, sola fide. That makes Abraham our father. Welcome to the synagogue. That may feel weird to you, I really don't care. Like, like, like Abraham is our father. We are grafted in the Old Testament, leaks straight into the New Testament in this passage, Romans chapter 4, moving into chapter Five, the Bible is one story, 
And Jesus saved Abraham. Am I tracking with that? Jesus saved Abraham and now he's saving you. Linked together, one story, one hero. The Bible is not a series of separate things. It is one idea, one people of God, one hero. His name is Jesus. Besides our eternal life, what does that do for us? Well, let's find out. In chapter 5, verse 1, welcome to join along with me here. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, because chapter 4 is true, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's for your now. We have peace with God. If your life has been a tormented wreck in the past, it's because you did not have peace with God. And, and you know a lot of folks, and I know a lot of folks, and maybe this was you at one time, maybe it's you as you sit here today, who do not know God, but think that God is for them. That is probably the most common person in your life. Would you agree with that? They don't know God because they don't believe in Jesus, but they think God is for them. See, that's real common here in America. That you'd have somebody in their mind having some kind of internal dialogue like this. I am blessed, therefore God must love me. My life is pretty smooth, therefore God must love me. By the way, that doesn't make you a Christian, that makes you a Hindu. That means you believe in Hinduism if you ever believe that, because that's karma. That is, God is blessing me because I have done something good, because my life is smooth, making connections there that don't work. The Bible has some interesting things to say about that. It says those who have rejected the Son are enemies of God. So uh, if, you, if you're not yet a believer in Jesus and you're sitting with us today, I'm ecstatic that you're here. And you're welcome to come with those beliefs for a long time. We want to have meals with you. We want to hang out with you. We want to party with you. But uh, understand that we're not going to stop saying what the Bible says, and that's what it says. Those who reject the Son are enemies of the Father because we were born enemies of the Father. Something must change that. And then you have those who you probably know, and maybe this is you sitting in the room, maybe this is you at one time, that have a strong sense that if God is not their friend, then we need to live our life in fear. And so much fear and guilt and shame that I'm, I'm not, not a functioning human being. But I don't know what to do about it. Well, here's what we know, and what, here's what basically verse 1 just told us, is that... There should be a, a healthy amount of fear there. We should, we should all be afraid. You understand that one reason the Old Testament is so violent is to show us that warring against God is warring against God and or his people is not a good place to be. People say, well, what's going on with God in the Old Testament? God is showing that he's a, he's a judge. And he's showing that you better not mess with him, his belief system, his way, or his people. It doesn't turn out well. He is giving you his character over and over again in the Old Testament. And to sum that up, now would be rejection of Jesus equals a war with God. That's where we are. You can, and we can, we can reject him over all and not be a believer, and we can reject him in the moment and go to war with God. That's, why we, that's what we talked about in Romans 1 for you Christians in the room. That you can go to war with God in a, in a singular moment today. Go, I don't really want to believe today. And it, and it, and it says, God, God is so gracious. He'll say, well, you can try that. You can go to war with me today if you like. My grace and mercy will be here. I'm, I'm so close you can reach out and touch me. I'm available here for you. But you can try that if you like. But you're not going to feel any peace in that moment. I had a sinful afternoon yesterday afternoon. The kid was right. Tim's usually pretty transparent, right? I had a sinful afternoon yesterday afternoon. And so my evening was, Tim, you've got to receive God's peace. You've got to, you've got to step into your belief. You've got to be filled with the Spirit because unless you do, you should not stand up before his people tomorrow. Because you tried to go to war with me for an afternoon. That's where you walk into confession and repentance, and this, these moments with God where you say, man, I am, so, I am so joyful right now about the blood of Jesus in the midst of me being a rebellious dude that the old man sometimes still shows up. 
No peace. If you are in the middle of sin and peaceful, something is wrong. Something is wrong. But look at the radical swing of this, of this passage. Simply believing in Jesus, full faith and trust in Jesus. The reason I can go ahead and stand up in here today after a sinful afternoon yesterday is that the belief in Jesus reverses all that. What does it mean to have peace with God? The all-time example of that, I have a friend named, named Jason. Jason lived a life different than mine in that he started seeking something for comfort other than Jesus very young, and it led him to a strong uh, meth methamphetamine addiction, uh, such a strong methamphetamine addiction that he began to try to just pay for his own by manufacturing his own and selling his own into a life that looked very much like something out of Breaking Bad. Um, but he had this call on his life that he needed something different. It probably helped that one time his wife had a knife at his throat saying, you really need something different. Like today. There are lives out there that look different than yours. And so he entered a rehab center on the day that happened for the 17th of 18 times. Knowing there was something better. Knowing there was a peace out there other than in methamphetamines. But Rehab centers aren't going to help. You guys, anybody has a drug addict in their family knows that rehab centers are not going to help anything except short term. Three prison stints for Jason, and he was, at the moment he came to Jesus, scheduled for his fourth. He had already been sentenced to 18 years for the manufacturing and distrib distribution of methamphetamines. And you know, you have jailhouse conversions, and then you have ones that are like this, where the Spirit actually indwells a man. And I don't know how this happened. I'm not claiming any kind of weirdness here. But somehow the courts lost his sentence. He got sent back into his home on probation and parole and never walked into prison for that fourth time. And he never took that for granted. Jason still stumbled around because although justification here, his being declared not guilty in an internal sense should have still carried the consequence of his earthly stuff, but somehow God even took that away and Jason felt peace, right? And so the fact he felt peace, though, brought exultation, but not instant life healing. Maybe that's your story sitting in here today. Peace with God but not instant life healing. So today is about exaltation. It's about feeling that which you should actually have encountered, feeling it. I hope this is an emotional day for you because that's what the whole passage is about is your emotions engaging that which has happened for you. I mean, Jason should have been a happy dude, right? Heaven preferable over hell, freedom preferable over prison, and his wife didn't kill him. He didn't get to find out about that eternity in the moment because she wanted to. I know her too. Our big idea this morning is this, that we feel exaltation not just at Christmas time. You can feel untouchable exaltation and joy. We need that, we need that word, exaltation. That's, that's our emotions feeling that which has happened to us. Exaltation. Exaltation. You guys did not sing with us exaltation today. I'm calling you into repentance. You sang like you had a turkey coma, which is probably true. Pecan pie, pumpkin pie, some kind of food coma that said, I'm going to limit what I feel today, but we can feel exaltation and joy. If we speak and believe this, 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 this Romans chapter 5, the beginning of it should be like, bookmarked in your Bible, and you should like read it every day and engage your emotions in what you're reading because it's a string, it's a series of statements about our faith that if you sense what they're actually saying, you cannot feel anything but exultation and joy. Or otherwise, you don't understand your situation before you met Christ and the peace that Jesus has brought. You don't really understand it if you don't feel exultation and joy. Verse 2 says this, through him, 
Through him, Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Read this with me. And we rejoice. No, 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 no. Heck no. We rejoice. Your emotions have to feel that in the hope of the glory of God. Oh, my goodness. You cannot be mundane in that moment. You cannot. We've obtained access. We rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. What do we rejoice in? This is a, this is a beautiful picture of God's economy. He desires most of all to reveal his glory in us. And I say apparently he reveals it really well. Because these words are not mincing any words. There's no mystery to these words. There's no mystery here unless I, unless I haven't, I can't see it. See like, see, like Jason knows how far he's been brought. So he like lives every day in this, in this rejoicing. See, I think you just think you've been brought a little, little ways. Just from being a little bit of a sinner into, into yeah, Jesus is going to get me in the head. It's just, it's just a little ways. So you think you have a different story than Jason as we talk here today. Maybe I think that. See, because when I see my level of my depravity and see what God has done, I see myself as Jason, not, not as the good dude who just added Jesus to his good dudeness. See, it's okay to live in exaltation and joy. Like, do you need permission? I know you're a bunch of introverts. It's, it's, I mean, it shows that we're a collection of introverts here. So it's okay if it's not coming out towards me, but it is it in your soul. Introverts feel the same things. It may just not be expressed the same. So is it the same in your soul? So how does this actually work? Not how would we like for this to work. How does this actually work? See, Jason still had some realities he had to deal with. The next day after he was healed, he still had this little gnaw that he might want to get high. Anybody have that with your sin issue? Like some of you spent like crazy shopping this week. Maybe you use that to numb. And maybe you've repented of that before and the little gnaw stayed in there. I don't know. Is that different than Jason's? We still think so if we've been raised in a church that had the list. You know, like the list. Well, Jason was all over the list. But spending, shopping, that's not a big deal. My comfort yesterday, yesterday afternoon, not a big deal. He struggled with the desire to get high. And oh yeah, he had to patch things up with a wife that he had to live with. He's still with. That's 50, we're about 15 years into this thing now. And oh yeah, some kids who were aware that their mama had put the, a knife to the throat of the daddy who had been violent with her when stoned off his head the night before they watched it. They're going to be in counseling for the next 30. Some of you have that story in this room. You were the kids, right? So there's still some reality, some work to do. So let's let God address those. Verse 3. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Oh, now see God. See Paul's just meddling now, right? You were you, Paul. You were you were doing great here with this nice fluffy deal. Like we get peace with God because Jesus, this little baby, came, took care of us. It's Christmas time. Paul, you were doing great. Now look what you're doing to us here. He's meddling, right? Let's go through the sequence. Knowing that suffering produces inner endurance and. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. I mean, we, had, we, you know, we started with the Lauren Daigle song. Not everybody can sing that, by the way. Thank you for putting that together for us. Like, we, you know, like, it's the light of the world. We sing this nice, this nice song that leads us into Christmas. Oh, I'm feeling warm. I'm feeling fluffy. Now Paul gut shots us here, right? He has a tendency to do that. Why? Because he knows what we need. We had to get to the how God produces hope. You say, well, that's not the way it would happen on a Hallmark channel. 
Yeah, some of you got an addiction, I know. You didn't shop this week, but you went binging on Hallmark. Because on Hallmark, there's, right, there's always this lonely middle-aged female stuck in a career that she really doesn't like, and God brings hope by bringing this man. And he just happened to just have been widowed, and he's a stud, and he's rich, and he has some teeth. And somehow out of the deal, she gets a puppy and a kiss in the snow. And she learns a lesson. you got to slow down in the holidays. And you get the man. Well, first of all, that's just dumb because men are not really that great of a gift, right? I mean, some of you women can testify here right now. Because that dude who looked like he was a stud and was just widowed, he, he leaves the lid up on the toilet and pees on the floor just like all the rest of you men. Just another sinner in a broken world. <laughs> Hallmark's not the answer. Right? So, but God's asking us to have our mind completely renewed here. Completely different way to thinking. He says he will give us hope through a different vehicle. So at the beginning of last week, I was really discouraged. Like some of you know this, like in January, on January 29th, they're going to they're gonna open my hip up and they're going to completely disassemble my hip and put some metal in there and, and, and put it back together. It's a major surgery, two months down. And so I, that's, I wish they would like do it tomorrow. Anybody ever had something like that? Like, can we just like do this like tomorrow and like start healing and get this, get this thing over? Because the thought of it coming produces suffering, probably more than the pain that will do it. But the guy who does this particular surgery is the only one that does it in the whole Midwest. It's hard to get him. And, I, and I'm, just, I'm just frustrated because I'm really enjoying coaching at, at Fox. That's really hard for me because I'm a Northwest grad and we just hate Fox. And so this has been like this work of God in me, right? And so, uh, and I'm loving pastoring you right now. I mean, I, I can just flat say that. I'm really enjoying both things. And then what happens beginning of last week is because my hip is not right, I, this leg is working more than usual. Any of you that have ever had one of these issues know that sometimes this happens. And so this knee went like completely out last Monday. And I literally, walking upstairs, tears one time hit the wall. And that's from the dude who didn't, you guys know my story, I didn't cry for 20 years. So tears don't come easy to me. And I thought, man, this is just too much. And so... So what happens on Monday afternoon, I was scheduled to dig into this passage to teach you. And I go, Paul, you got to be kidding, man. Like, like you're going to walk me through this sequence while I got tears flying out of my eyes from pain I haven't felt before. What's the sequence? Are you, because it, this thing that he says here requires supernatural intervention, right? Those of you that have, are in some tough times, Maybe you're, you're emotionally in some tough times. Maybe you're spiritually in some tough times. Maybe you're, like me, physically in some tough times. It's not natural to have, uh, like, sharp blades stuck into particular joints in your body and rejoice, right, Mary? I mean, you, you did, when was your knee replacement? Like, last year one time. Yeah, yeah. What, a month ago? Six months ago, yeah. I was going to say, you look great. Jesus is good, man. But pain from the curse is just not the way it was supposed to be, right? I mean, we we're supposed to be in the garden. There were no knee replacements, hip replacements in, in the garden. There was no death. There were all this pain that we feel. There were no broken relationships. But the Bible says, listen to this closely, the Bible says that Jesus was taught not only obedience in his suffering, but also joy. And so my line to people always is this, why do you think he would teach you obedience and joy any other way than the way he experienced it? And so he starts to have lines like this, that fly in the face of fluffy gospel preaching, right? So it must be something supernatural that would allow me to rejoice in suffering. Would you agree with that? Something supernatural has to happen to us to allow us to rejoice. It doesn't say grin a little bit and bear it. The word is the same as when you realize you have peace with God. Rejoice in your suffering. Because what's happening? He says, then, if you do that, rejoice in suffering. Can we go through the sequence, Aaron? Then, suffering produces endurance. 
because this is not the last time we're going to struggle. This is not the last time we're going to struggle. I just listed all of Jason's struggles that were continuing. As he worked his way through each one of those issues with Jesus, with the Spirit, with godly people, he produced endurance. And eventually, endurance produced character. I, and by the way, I just cannot think of a time, of any time I've ever been alive, and if there's been a time any more than this, I'd have to see it to believe it, that this particular passage needs to be worked out definitely across the church and throughout all of our culture. Because we don't think like this. We don't think, let's dig in and work through these things so that the end result is character. And then it says character produces hope. So what we want to do in our, I can go to McDonald's and get a meal in an average of 44 seconds, is I want to go straight from belief Peace with God to hope. And Paul says, that's not the way I'm going to teach it to you. Spirit through Paul says, that's not the way I'm going to teach it to you. Let me just say it this way. I believe we live in a day and an age with a lot of hopelessness because we do not develop people of character, and it starts with the way that we parent. If you have children in this room, you need to hear this. We do not, in our culture, allow children to suffer well. And therefore, we sidetrack the God of the universe creating hopeful people. Am I tracking with that? Like, this message needs to be, it just needs to be proclaimed everywhere. To not, to not yet believers, to Hindus, to Muslims, to everybody. Like, we need to let our children suffer well. See, here's what we think in this country now. We think if we let them experience suffering, we are bad parents. Most would say that's the definition of a bad parent. And we have a new term. Because our pride comes in attacks. 20, 30 years ago, we began to develop this term called helicopter parents, right? You guys have all read blogs and you never really paid a whole lot of attention. Helicopter parents, uh, when there's an issue in in a child's life, uh, a helicopter parent will swoop in in the middle of the issue having get, gotten started and swoop their child out of the issue, whatever it is. Why? Can't let my child suffer. I'm a bad parent. My job is to make sure my child never suffers. So we developed helicopter parents 20 to 30 years ago. Well, that was not good enough. So now we have a term called lawnmower parents. And if you haven't read about this and you're a parent in the room, you need to. There's an excellent blog out there with 11 ways you can know that you are a lawnmower parent. Lawnmower parents supersede helicopter parents. They go, we'll never let the child get into the issue that they might need a helicopter. We will lawnmower everything out of their way in preparation to make sure they never have a suffering issue. And so they begin to remove any possibility of suffering. Here's, here's one way you can know you're a lawnmower parent. If your child plays with other children and you make sure that all those children have their own toys in a particular environment, like you have a neighborhood child who has a toy and you make sure your child has that same toy so that when they play together, both children have that same toy so that they could never fight over the one toy. You know what you just did to them? They cannot now learn how to share, how to suffer through the idea of, no, Joey says, oh, no, that's mine, right? And we all learn the idea of character production Because they suffered in an environment for a little while together. Parents' job would be to shepherd that, make sure no child loses an eye. Right? I mean, that's the the parent's job. Let's make sure there's no debilitating, like, disfigurement that comes out of this fight over this singular toy. But a lawnmower parent would make sure that fight never happens again. You understand? Character comes out of that squabble. Lawnmower parents make sure that fight never could occur. There's some crying to teach this year. Take some work, some suffering. If there's toys for everyone, there's no angst. The Bible just said your child will have a lack of character if there's never any angst in their life. Second way you can know, if you always redshirt your kids to where they're the oldest in the class, or the oldest on a team, rather than the youngest, you might be a lawnmower parent. I feel like Jeff Foxworthy up here right now, right? 
like we're defining rednecks or something. Obviously, we never want to let our little sheep suffer to the point of severe emotional damage. The object is not to have them in counseling for 30 years, but it, it's obvious that God wants problems to hit our souls to develop our character. Because we never know what hope looks like until we've seen the other side of the coin. He says, our character is what will actually produce a hopeful people. I've been there. We, he wants his people to say, I've been there. I've been in that fight. I've, I've been in the middle of that angst. And I watched God work us through that angst. That creates hope. If we shield difficulty and difficulty comes, and we've never learned how to work through it, it makes us a hopeless people. Are you tracking with this? Boils down to, we should not fear suffering. We should not create our own suffering. That's poverty gospel. That's dumb. But we should not fear suffering. Why? Well, God continues, verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame. The sequence continues. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So another big idea this morning is suffering may come, but shame does not come with it because of the agape love. You need to learn that word. The love that Jesus has for you is agape love. It's, it's, a, it's a love that just is poured on you and you don't deserve for it to come. And the Spirit pours it in. And I mean pours. Sometimes a, a little uh, Greek word study does some good. The Greek word for poor there is abundantismi. Okay? Abundantismi. And that Greek word is the word abundant. So it's like, what I want you to visualize is this love is not a trickle to you. Sometimes I think that God, we think that God's love is like this little trickle for us. And we realize that God himself came to this earth like the Philippians 2 passage that Lacey read a little while ago. And, and as the form of a servant, abundantly poured himself out for us, abundantly poured himself out for us, and now pours all of that same grace into us. We need to hear abundance. Lavish is another great word that has been lost out of the English language because we've simplified our language so much. Lavishly amount poured is what that Greek word means here. Do you feel that? I would just ask you, do you feel that? The reason I don't think, you can claim your, your uh, shyness you, in the idea that we don't get very loud about our feelings about Jesus sometimes. I say it's a lot more that we have not felt like that love was lavishly poured into us. We're still waiting. We're, I'll put it this way. We're still waiting for the next thing to, to excite us. Like, like what, what's the music going to look like next week? Is, is it Mark Sigma coming back? What, what could possibly stir my deal? Just, it should be enough. This idea of lavish love being poured into you should be enough. How significant is it to realize that God's love displayed at the cross has been poured into our hearts? Not dripped in like some little old coffee maker that has a, has a water problem, right? But poured in there and remains there in the dwelling presence of a full member of the Trinity. Contemplating our spirit and dwelltness should stir us. God has not left us alone. He has not only poured his love into us, he has the love remains because the spirit indwells. A full member of the Trinity lives in you. God himself. And that's too much. That's too good. And to be hope-filled, we're honestly just getting started. These are the best statements of faith in the Bible. Verse 6, for while we were still weak at the right time, God died for the ungodly. That's just the best, man. But see, God's economy is backwards to us, so we Americans have a hard time even perceiving that passage. Because you've all been taught, when you are strong, you are strong. Be strong. And God comes along here and goes, for while we were weak, while we're weak, when we're weak, we'll feel that love. 
until you feel weak, you won't feel that love because you're still trying to be strong yourself. And God says, no, you are actually never strong. How, well, the Bible says you can do how much outside of him? How much, do you believe that? See, I think you all, everybody in here just quoted that. I don't think you believe it. Because you're, you'll wake up tomorrow and try to run your Monday. I've got this, God. No, 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 no. God's saying, while well, you're weak, you're strong. When, when, you're, when you're weak and you're full of me, you're strong. When you, you will not feel my love. You will not feel hope because you are not a hopeful person by nature. You're trying to be strong and you're trying to stir your own hope. You're going to fail. Why don't we feel hope? Only in your submitted weakness are you strong. God's gospel is good news when you realize that you have no ability to do anything about the brokenness around you and in you. And you simply have this realize, realization that all that you need has been lavishly poured into you by the Holy Spirit. Lavishly poured into you by the Holy Spirit. There's no merit in you. There's nothing you can do. At that realization, the death of Christ on our behalf begins to reveal love. His sinless life becomes our life. But the next time you feel hopeless, understand that you are feeling hopeless because you're having faith in you. Faith in me, faith in some human aspect. Oh, but it gets better. We're just starting with the best declarations in the Bible. Anybody excited in here? You might get your affections stirred yet. Verse 7, for one will scarcely die. So this is a human notion. One will scarcely die for a righteous person even, though perhaps for a good reason one would even dare to die. We'll go to war. We'll run up on Normandy Beach. We'll run up on Omaha Beach. We'll defeat the Nazis. We'll do something that's really good. But God showed his love for us that he died for the Nazis, died for us while yet Sinners, Christ died for us. That's what distinguishes him from us. <laughs> That's what it means by why you're still weak. That's maybe the most significant scripture available to us in all the, the Bible. It's, it's the one that gets me. I, I try to declare this daily. See, in our way of thinking, let me just, let me just put this for you in a way I think you can understand. We will do something loving for someone when they have qualified for that love. Some of you have seen my definition of human, human love before. We got that, Aaron? Okay, here's the definition of human love. I will love you when you do what I want. That's the source of all your relationships. You understand that, right? The source of every marital problem, every relationship problem that you have inside family, all of that is these people are not doing what I want, and so I'm holding back my love. So the definition of human love, I will, I will love you when you do what I want. God just stated his definition of love. My love has qualifiers. You must qualify, but God redefines love here. He brings love to us while we are his sworn enemies. While we hated him, he died for us. So that changes the game, right? If, if, if I'm now a hope-filled person and I've received Jesus, it changes my marriage. It changes every relationship in my life. I am now to bring agape love, poor love, in the midst of somebody not deserving it. All of you need to contemplate any conflict in your life right now and say, if I were to love as Jesus loved right now, what would that look like? Because really what you're doing is you're upset and mad and pulling rebellious withholding of your love because this person is not qualified for it. They've not treated you well. Probably true. Jesus comes and says, you need to love like me. And just pour love there. See, our reconcil reconciliation with people changes. We're all waiting for them to do something. Jesus says, no, you be, you, you're, you're me. Go be the initiator. Go initiate the reconciliation. You understand that without Jesus initiating reconciliation with the Father, you sit here in your sin, bound for hell, because you would never initiate toward them. That's what the Bible says. And Jesus comes with and lavishes his love on you. That's why theology matters. Correct theology matters. Because that changes us now. It says... Um, 
I need to be the initiator of grace before my conflict partner repents. Why? Because you're the Jesus person. You're the one with the love to pour. You have somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus in your life that you would desperately love to see Jesus. You have probably been waiting for them to repent to love them really well because they're a butthead. What do, what do sinners do? They act like a butthead. They can do no other until you pour the love of Jesus in them so that they can be reconciled to God, feel peace, and now they will change. We are the initiators of grace. We are the initiators of reconciliation. That's what 2 Corinthians is talking about when it says, you have received the ministry of reconciliation, now you are in the ministry of reconciliation. That means pour love before anybody changes around you. I pursue in love and forgiveness. I initiate, not demand repentance first. If you're demanding repentance first, you are living as an unbeliever. Welcome to City on a Hill. If you are demanding repentance first from somebody you're in relationship with, you are living in that moment as an unbeliever. I'm not saying you're an unbeliever. I'm saying you're living in that moment as one. Verse 9. Since, therefore, we have been justified by his blood, oh my, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. It's not just his death. You are being saved now. You will be capable of being the reconciler inside your marriage pouring love on somebody that does not deserve it because you've been given Jesus. That's what that said. That should be very hopeful for you, that you contain the ability to do that because the Spirit has been poured in you. Let me track that with you one more time. You now have the ability to be that initiator of the ministry of reconciliation in every broken relationship in your life because of Jesus life having been given to you. Stop thinking it's just about his death forgiving your sins. It is about his life. His righteousness has been given to you by the power of his spirit, lavishly poured into you. More than that, Paul continues, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We are a spoiled lot here in America, and we wait for things to get better before we will rejoice. Therefore, nobody comes to Jesus around us. Those are kind of some hard words, right? But it's just true. If you wait for your circumstances get to get better before you rejoice, what, why would that make you look any different than any human being on this planet? The difference maker is for Christians is that we rejoice when things suck. And everybody goes, man, that's just so different. Like it's been cloudy and rainy and snowy and the weather's terrible. I tell all my people who live in really nice places, I say, well, yeah, you're rejoicing, rejoicing all the time. That's easy. You got no angst in your life just from the weather. San Diego cats that I can't stand. There's some issues there. See, I told you, I spent all day yesterday in sin. See, I can't provide you anything more hopeful than what you just read. If you're, if you're looking for something other than peace with God to s- put your stake of hope in, (laughs) you're going to have a long wait to feel hopeful. A life of frustration. I mean, all you need are the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5. It fixes everything about you and God, and it fixes everything about you and every human being you live around. What else would you need? To feel hope. You feel rejoicing joy. You will not see the wrath of God due to the love of Christ. You will not see the wrath of God because of the loving blood of Christ. Not just for your eternity, it's for your now. We say that around here all the time, right? This place will grow when we believe that. This place will grow when we believe that. When we actually believe it and not just say it. When we actually believe it. His sinless life is being gifted to you day to day. And so we 
Rejoice. His sinless life is being gifted to you day by day. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. His sinless life is being gifted inside your soul day by day. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. His sinless life is being gifted inside your soul. Let me put it this way. This is not in the script. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, this is what it means that it says that God taught him joy in his suffering. As he is hanging on a cross, anguish of not only physical terrorism, but anguish because he knows that all of your sin, all of my sin, all of the sin of 20 billion people is about to be crushed on him. He feels joy. Why? Because he can see you. The Spirit is giving him snapshots on the cross of you. Hope. Another day, in his current day, because he is at complete peace with the Father, you will never have that experience where you can rejoice in the middle of suffering until you feel complete peace with the Father. Everybody tracking with this? Man, this is, this is just like so much what we need. Let me, let me go to an old head, an old British head. So there's some British language in here, so just hang in with this. John Stott wrapped up Romans 5, 1 through 11 like this. If you don't read old dead white dudes or dead dudes, black, purple, whatever, you need to read all kinds of dead dudes sometimes. We should be the most positive people in the world. Would you agree with that? We should. doesn't matter what your circumstances are. We should be the most positive people in the world. In the world, we cannot mooch around the place with a dropping hang dog expression. It's like John Sutton and I hang around, right? I always tell you, you look like your dog just died, right? We cannot drag our way through life moaning and groaning. We cannot always be looking on the dark side of everything as neg- negative prophets of doom. No, we exult in God. Then every part of our life becomes suffused with glory. Christian worship becomes a joyful celebration of God and, and Christian living a joyful service of God. So come, let us exalt God together. Let me pray. Father, thank you. We exalt you. We feel joy in the midst of you. We rejoice. And may that rejoicing become natural so that when people encounter us, they see something different. Your glorious praise. Father, we thank you for this opportunity right now that we get to conclude our worship here with an expression of our rejoicing to you. You have some things, some ways for us to do that. You know, we can we can dig into your word. We can share your word with each other. We can express love through uh, making meals for each other, maybe as we have over the last few days. And 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 just that idea that we can we can cook a gift of yours of good food and share it with each other is an expression of rejoicing of thankfulness in you but then you have some ways that you just say i need you to do this and i need you to do it in this particular way and one of those is for us to take a piece of bread and and understand that you said on the night that you were betrayed that that piece of bread was your body which would be in the next 24 hours busted up on our behalf there were no broken bones in it, but there, were, there was a, a thrashing, a, a terrorism against it of, of, of supreme suffering. And so as we take that piece of bread, may we not take that as just some kind of little mundane uh, act of worship. You know, that's just what you do. You take communion. May, may it be this moment where we, we kind of live in this realization as we taste that bread, that this actually happened, that we are remembering the body of Jesus, his, his life, not just his death, but his life, his, his perf- perfect life that we've now been gifted with. May we rejoice somehow as we understand we are not like him and yet we're made like him through this act. And then we take a, a cup and we dip that bread in and we, and we taste this juice that is to remind us tactily of uh, the blood of the new covenant. You held up a cup and you said, this is, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so you, you're directly referring there that there's life in the blood and your death would bring hope because without it, we have no hope. 
And so as we taste that, may we not have, once again, a mundane experience, but may we rejoice that we once were not at peace with the Father, but because you died and you gifted us with the forgiveness through that death that we are at peace with the Father. His wrath does not set on us today. Have joy. You're good. May our time here be an expression of just how good you are to us, how hope-filled it is. May we stop viewing our suffering as, as punishment. May we start viewing our suffering as something you have allowed in our life to, to hone us, to hone our character, which then will hone our hope. May we be a hopeful people in the midst of our suffering. May we rejoice in our suffering because uh, it's your uh, way <laughs> of changing us. May it start today with this act of communion together as we take a family meal together. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you are new with us. Uh, communion is open here to anybody. You don't have to be a member of this church. You do need to be a professed Christian. You need to, do need to believe that Jesus is the way, that Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection is the only way for us to be at peace with the Father. If you believe that, you are welcome to come take a piece of this bread, dip it in the cup, and then just experience Christ. Um, Matt is going to come do a benediction over us. But if you need to do some business with God here today, so that maybe you walk out of here as a person of rejoicing, regardless of your circumstances, that would be so. My surgery is still coming, lest God decide to miraculously heal me, which I believe he still does. And yet I have intentions of for the next two months living a life as a rejoy, of a joyful man. Rejoicing that my life could be a lot worse. I could be at odds, at war with the God of the universe. And that is not a place we want to be. So I invite you to his table to celebrate together that you are not at war with God today. If you are a believer in Jesus, peace has been won by that blood. So come and experience it and spend time with him wherever you need. If you need to go, 